Well, good morning. God is good, isn't he? And all the time? Amen. God is good. We have been in a series entitled, I Love My Church. And there are many ways to show your love for your church. We've, we've looked at some. I want to challenge you to affirm your love for the church by getting connected in meaningful relationships, by getting involved in fruitful service, by giving generously with a joyful heart, by honoring spiritual leaders, and by sharing your faith with those who have not yet come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to talk about honoring spiritual leaders. I was sick last week, as some of you know, and uh, my daughter, my six-year-old granddaughter, Leah, said to my wife, I said, Grammy, why does Pop Pop sound like Martin Luther King? <laughs> my voice was real deep. First, I thought she was comparing my eloquent uh, preaching abilities to that of Martin Luther King, but I realized it was my deep voice that did that. So um, I feel much, much better and uh, appreciate your prayers in that. Would you say this after me? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One more time. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. The Bible says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Announcing peace and bringing news of happiness. And the Bible says as well that if we, um, if we receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, we receive the, a prophet's reward. The Bible exhorts us throughout Scripture to recognize and honor and affirm those who have the call of God on their lives and the anointing of God for to minister. So we're going to look at that. How many of you know that God's greatest gifts to his church are leaders? God's greatest gift to his church are leaders, godly leaders who lead his people into good paths, into right ways, into the fullness of the purpose of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 to 12 says, talking is, quote, he's quoting from the Old Testament and talking about Jesus Christ. When he ascended on high, that is when Christ ascended after his resurrection to the right hand of God, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens. And like a triumphal procession where the captives are led, the defeated enemy was led in front of the army as captives, and then the victorious army would march, and the, they would give gifts, they would throw out gifts to the crowds on either side. So he's saying when Jesus ascended to the right hand of God, he took with him many captives and gave gifts to his people. But what were the gifts that he gave. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers to equip his people for the work of service. His gifts to the church are leaders. Jeremiah 3.5 says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and with understanding. And a great verse, Second Chronicles 2.11, because the Lord loves his people, this is Queen of Sheba saying to Solomon, because the Lord loves his people, he gave you to be their king. He showed his love for his people by the leadership and the leaders he provided. There are many different ways and, and, and ceremonies for affirming leadership 
and recognizing and honoring leaders. It may be the crowning of a king, it may be the dubbing of a knight, it may be the anointing on the priest of the oil, it may be the mantle of a prophet or the robe of a judge, it may be the inauguration ceremony of a president, it may be the ordination of a pastor, it may be as simple as a key to the executive washroom that recognizes your leadership position. Um, so God has, has created and ordained certain ways to, rec- to recognize his people. Philip Yancey tells of a time when he was visiting in a Amish, Amish home and the unusual procedure they had for uh, picking pastoral leaders. They would, uh, the congregation would gather together and they would submit on cards names of people that they felt, um, men in their congregation that they felt were, um, had the potential for pastoral leadership. And, and all those who received at least three votes would be seated at a, a long table and at, that, at each seat there would be a, a hymnal. So the men just sat randomly at the table and they would open up their hymnal and the one that had a card in it saying, you are our, new, our pastor this year, um, was the one who was the pastor. That's how he became pastor. His responsibilities for the next year was to preach twice a week, 90 hour, 90 minute sermons twice a week for a year. And, and Philip Yancey asked the family, well, what if, what if this person doesn't feel qualified? And they looked at him a little puzzled, saying, well, of course he's not qualified. We wouldn't accept him if he thought he was qualified. We want a humble person who's dependent upon God, not a person who feels like they're qualified. So there are unusual ways sometimes of recognizing that, God's leadership on a person's life, but it's important that we recognize those whom God has placed his mantle of leadership on. Let me give you a definition of spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders are those individuals who because of their maturity of faith and understanding of the ways of God inspire and trust confidence in their leadership. Spiritual leaders are those individuals who because of their their maturity of faith and because of their understanding of the ways of God inspire the trust and confidence of those who follow his leadership. Spiritual leadership is not just a matter of having a title, filling a position. Spiritual leaders are not chosen by the pastor or the elders or the leadership team or the vote of the congregation. Spiritual leaders are those who are called by God and anointed by the Spirit of God to lead the people of God into the purpose of God. In Acts 20, 28, Apostle Paul says to the leaders of the Ephesian church, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Our responsibility is to recognize and affirm those whom God has called and appointed as spiritual leaders um, who the Holy Spirit has made them overseers of. And because of their maturity of faith and understanding of the ways of God and the calling of God in their life, they inspire our confidence to follow their leadership. Now, it's not always easy to recognize those who have the mantle of leadership, because we have some, uh, the idea of American heroes, American leaders is a little bit different than the scripture. The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And that verse is given in the context of the choosing of David to be the next, next king of Israel. 
the prophet Samuel came to Jesse, David's father, said, bring your sons out to me because I'm going to anoint one of them to be king over Israel. So he brought, they brought seven of his sons. And the first son, Eliab, Samuel thought, surely this must be the, the man of God. This must be the, the leader that God's chosen for his, his people because he, he was tall, handsome, rugged. He looked like a, a middle linebacker for the New York Giants. He looked like he, he had the type of personality. It all just, he just exuded confidence. He must be the leader. And God said, no, he's not the leader. He's not the one I've chosen. So, he's, so he goes, okay, we'll go to number two. He looks like he could be the guy. No, he, God says no. Goes number three. No. Number four. Number five. Number six. Number seven. No. And then he said, the prophet said, I don't understand. These are all your sons? He said, well, there's this little runt named David out in the field with a few sheep. He said, well, bring them. And sure enough, he was the one. He was not invited to his own coronation and, uh, because he didn't look like the type of leader that we often expect. The kind of leader most of us want to be and to be under are those larger-than-life larger kind of leaders who compel our loyalty by their commanding presence and charismatic personality. We want leaders who are well-educated, articulate, decisive, and charming, yet humble, authentic, approachable, and down to earth. <laughs> we want an, an illusion is what we want. The fact is, most of God's leaders walk with a limp rather than a strut. Most of God's leaders are damaged in part struggle with issues just like you and I struggle with. And God chooses flawed vessels. And it's the very flawedness, if that's a word, flawedness, <laughs> the very flaw of, their, of who they are in, in their Makeup is what compels us to follow them. Let me, give you, let me tell you what I mean by that. Most of us think of, when we think of heroes and leaders, we think of somebody like Rambo. Rambo's got his guns and his knives, and he, he breaks into the prison, single-handedly kills 55 people, um, and, and the, pull, saves the guy out of prison. And he never gets a nick on him. So we think of those type of leaders. But I, th I think that God's, God's leaders are much more like Frodo. <laughs> who had the task of bringing the ring of power to the fires of Mordor. And he was not in himself capable of doing that. Or he, uh, he wasn't likely to think that he was someone great. Especially the more he... he proceeded on in his task. God's leaders are much more like Frodo. Someone said this, they said, God chooses the foolish because only the foolish are foolish enough to say yes. <laughs> and they say yes to God usually because they don't know what they're getting into. And uh, God says, yes, I'll take that. And his yes corresponds to our yes to him. And we need to have a yes posture toward spiritual leaders, recognizing those whom God has called. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, let a man regard us in this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Servants of Christ. The word servant is not the usual word for slave, which is doulos in the Greek. It's the word hupokrites. Hupokrites means an under rower, which is a specific type of slave, a galley slave. 
the galley slaves were down in the bottom of the boat, and they just, they row, and that's what they do. They're all day. All day. They, they row and they eat and they sleep. And uh, they hate it when the captain wants to go water skiing. And uh, <laughs> they, they have to row in accordance with the, what they're planning to do, ram a ship or, or travel or whatever. But he compares himself to an, an under rower, a, a galley slave. What, what are some of the implications of that for leadership? It means, first of all, a leader doesn't serve to be seen by men. A leader doesn't serve to be seen by men. If we're interested in being seen and, and in the showcase and the spotlight all the time, then we've missed the heart of leadership. A leader doesn't serve to be seen of men. He doesn't try to do it all himself. He's a member of a team that he works in conjunction with and together with. A leader lives his life in obedience to the captain. Um, and what the captain dictates is what he's to do. A leader follows the pace of the captain. And the captain keeps things moving. One of the primary responsibilities of leadership is basically to keep God's people moving. The Bible says that the going forth of the Lord is as certain as the dawn. As sure as the sun's coming up tomorrow, and you can be sure that God is going to go on, that the purpose of God is going to go forth. And we have, a, you know, we, we have a tendency to reach a certain status quo, and we... Just stay there. We say, well, okay, this is a nice, comfortable place. We're settled, we're established, and we'll just settle here. And a leader who just stays in one step, maintains the status quo, is not a leader, he's a manager. And God's not interested in managing, staying where we are. Now, God gives us a little rest from time to time, but he's... He, the leader comes out and says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, Let's move because God is moving on. And when you were in the desert and the cloud lifted and the cloud started moving on, which provided you air conditioning uh, in the desert, and that cloud started moving, you moved with it, or you felt the heat of the, the desert. And the leader is one who bears the burdens of those on board. Let me share this about leadership, and then we're going to proceed with our ordination service. Hebrews 13, 7 says this. Remember those who led you. In other words, they had a leadership that was worth following. Remember those whose leadership you followed, who spoke the word of God to you. Not only did they have a leadership that was worth following, they had a message that was worth hearing. And considering the outcome of their conduct, which is the, the, the outcome of their, their way of life, they had a lifestyle that was worth considering. Imitate their faith. They had a faith that was worth imitating. And then in verse 7, 17 of Hebrews 13, it says, Obey them and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who give an account. They had an authority that's worth trusting. They have a leadership that is worth following, they have a message that's worth hearing. They have a lifestyle that's worth considering. They have a faith that's worth imitating. And they have an authority that's worth trusting. Let's just look at these real quickly. A leader is someone who is leading. That would make sense. 
a leader is someone who has followers. If you want to say, well, how do I know if I'm a leader? Well, just look behind you. See if you have any followers. Um, people who are following your example, your lifestyle, your teaching, your ministry, and so on. Um, a leader is someone who is leading. A leader has followers. A title doesn't give you followers. A title gives you subordinates. A follower is someone who trusts your leadership enough to take the risk of following. And a leader is leading his followers somewhere. A leader knows where he's going and how, he, how to get there. Doesn't mean he's arrived. Doesn't mean he knows all the answers. Means he knows the direction to which to, to go with God. Let me, let me give you an example of what Paul would say. If he said, Paul, where, where are you going? What is your, where are you ultimately leading us? He would say, like in Acts 20, verse 24, he would say, I want to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Or in Colossians 1, 28, 29, he says, we proclaim him, Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all the energy that works so mightily within me. So he had, he had a mission, he had a direction, he had, a, and if you wanted to go where he wanted to go, if this corresponds to your heart and to what God's doing in your life, then you, a leader has a leadership worth following. They have a message worth hearing. A godly leader's message rings true and ministers life and dispenses grace. A godly leader not only knows where he's going, but he is endeavoring to go where God is going. All too often we ask God to bless what we're doing. God says, why don't you get in on what I'm doing? Because I always bless what I'm doing. And so instead of getting God, come on God, would you bless what we're doing? God says, seek me to find where I'm going and what I'm doing and get in on that, and, and you'll find God's blessing in it. He says this in First Thessalonians 2.4. He says, both we and our message are free of error, mixed motives, and hidden agendas. We never use words to butter you up. This is from the message. We never use words to butter you up or use words as a smokescreen to take advantage of you. And we never threw our weight around trying to imp impress you or, or act, come across as important. He says our message is free from error. Error is when you say what the Word of God doesn't say. It contradicts what the Word of God says. It's just plain wrong. Mixed motives when we make the Word of God say what we want it to say. When we make the word of God say what we want to say. How many of you know you can make the word of God say whatever you want to say? You take it out of context. You take a verse here, a verse there. Um, and you throw it all together in some patchwork uh, smorgasbord. And you've, you can make it say whatever you want to say. There's a, a Greek, in Greek mythology, there's a character named Procrustes. Procrustes owned an inn on a mountain pass. And in this inn, he only had one room and one bed. So you would stay there and you would sleep there. But if you were, if you, you were too long for the bed, he would cut your feet off to make you fit. If you were too short for the bed, he would stretch you to make you fit. Procrustean bed is, is when we, we, take, we take the word of God, don't we, and do that. We cut off what we don't want, we'll just eliminate that. And we stretch the word of God to say what we do want it to say. So he had a, Paul says, 
Not only do you, uh, le- does the leader have uh, a leadership worth following, but a message worth hearing. And a leader has a lifestyle worth considering. Lifestyle, consider the outcome of your way of living. That's the direction of your life. Consider the outcome of the, the ultimate direction the person's your leader is leading. Lifestyle is the outward expression of inward character. So what you, what you are on the inside is going to come out in your character. Or what your, your character is going to come out in your lifestyle. Joe Frazier, the boxer, said, no matter if you have if you're making a fight plan or you're making a life plan, when you get in the ring, it comes down to your reflexes. And so we can have all our plans and, and so on, but when you get into the arena of life, you're going to, your lifestyle will reflect your character. Number four, faith worth imitating. A faith worth imitating. It says don't, don't just imitate their behaviors. Don't just imitate how they did things. So we, we get caught up in the, the externals. And uh, I'm sure the apostles, when they were the Christ's disciples, Christ would put his hand on someone's head and heal them of blindness or, or whatever they had. And I'm sure the disciples were saying, now, how did he do that? Wait a minute, he put, his, he put his left hand on there. So it won't, won't work with the right hand. Um, and he, he said, what were the words he said? We've got to get that exactly the way. And we looked for the methodology and for the exact way to make it happen by imitating the outward. He says, no, imitate my faith. Imitate what's inside me that, that gives me the ability to trust in God. So they imitate, imitate their faith. And finally, they have an authority worth trusting. They have an authority worth trusting. Our responsibility is to recognize genuine spiritual leaders and to support them. We say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We say, how lovely are the feet of him who brings good news and announces peace. When the right leader is in the right situation and God's hand is upon him and God's hand is upon the congregation, then there is peace and good news that follows. I wish I could say the church is the most peaceful place (laughs) you could be. That's not always true. But God gives us godly leaders that if we recognize and affirm and honor those leaders, they will bring the blessing of God through what they have to offer and by the call of God. Amen. 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 We're going to I'm going to call up on the platform. We're going to have our ordination service. So, Pastor Ernie, if you would come up. If the leadership team and elders would join us as well. I'm going to ask something as well. Some mothers to come up on the platform. Ernie is our youth pastor, so one of his primary flocks in the church is the youth. So I'm going to ask the, if the youth who are here, and the youth from the, from the youth group and workers, the, 
those who help as leaders in the youth ministry, if you would come up as well. Okay, we got as many up, up here as we do down there. So, it's great. We're going to have a scripture reading at this time. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, As you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toll and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Amen. Amen. At this time we're going to offer a charge to Ernesto. (laughs) People saying, who's that? (laughs) Pastor Ernie. We're going to offer a charge to him, to which you will respond, with the Lord is my helper, I will. Ernesto, <laughs> leaders always have everything under control, got it, <laughs> got it all worked out, here we go. Ernesto, motivated by a fervent love for God and a passion to proclaim the gospel, To a broken world, are you ready to affirm God's holy call on your life and commit yourself to faithfully serve Christ in wholehearted devotion and humble obedience? With the Lord as my helper, I will. Ernesto, will you shepherd and feed the flock of Christ committed to your care and provide spiritual oversight? Not out of obligation, but with a willing heart. Not for worldly gain but that people everywhere may come to the glorious freedom that is found in Christ alone. If the Lord is my helper, I will. Ernesto, will you be diligent in prayer and the study of scriptures so that you may clearly and accurately teach the word of God and lead God's people into the ways of God? If the Lord is my helper, I will. Ernesto, will you endeavor in, in the strength and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to live a life of sincere discipleship, to be loyal to the call of duty, and to faithfully discharge all the work of the ministry entrusted to you. If the Lord is my helper, I will. At this time, I'm going to ask that I'm going to give a charge to the congregation. Would you stand? Then following the, the, the giving of the charge, you will respond, the Lord, with the Lord is my helper, I will. 
The scriptures exhort you as the church of Jesus Christ to acknowledge your spiritual leaders as gifts given to your church by Christ himself. Honor them as stewards of the gospel, for they teach you the word of God. Consider their lifestyle and follow in their footsteps, for they lead you in the ways of God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls and will give an account to God for their faithfulness to their holy calling. Do you affirm that Ernesto Rivera be set apart to the ministry of the gospel? And do you agree to support him in his ministry on behalf of the church? And your response is, with the Lord as our helper, I will. Amen. Ernesto, would you kneel? And we're going to pray over him at this time. I'm going to ask that several people can pray. We'll just pass the mic around. Our Heavenly Father, we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him that brings good news. We affirm and honor the calling and the anointing upon Ernie's life. Pray that you would anoint him powerfully, that you would use him greatly, that many people would be, would be the fruit of his life who have come into the kingdom of God and found Christ as their life and their savior. We pray the abundance of your blessing and your goodness. May he be blessed and be a blessing to many. Yes. We pray in Jesus' name. Yes. Lord, I too want to pray for Ernie. Lord, I pray your blessing upon him. Lord, can help him to continue to lead the youth and, 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 and just guide their lives, Lord. Let him be a, um, just a, an example to them, Lord. Lord, I pray for him, to give him wisdom, Lord, to help lead us as in our church, Lord. I pray uh, as for his family, Lord, that they come alongside him and, and just be a blessing to him as well. Lord. Lord, we just ask that your hand is upon Ernie in his life as he, as he helps lead this church, Lord. I pray this in your name. Lord, we do bring our precious brother, your son, to your altar this morning. And, we, and I do pray that uh, you would bestow just incredible wisdom upon him, Lord, Amen. that um, beyond his, his own knowledge, beyond his own years, that you would fill him with the wisdom that is needed to lead and to direct. And I thank you for the shepherd's heart that you have given to him. I thank you for his family, for his mom and dad who have prayed over him and have... Uh, committed him to you, Lord, yes. and, uh, and have allowed him to, uh, to seek you and to, to find where you want him to serve. Thank you for his obedience. Continue to help him to be obedient. And uh, again, I thank you for the impact that he has already had on so many lives mm -hmm. and the lives of the youth in this church and outside of the church. Continue to use him in your precious name. My Father and my God, inasmuch as David was considered insignificant by his father, that he was not considered when Solomon, or rather Samuel, came to anoint the new king. Who knew that the young boy in the backyard was a king? was a battler, was an incredible shepherd of men. Father, my prayer is that inasmuch as we have seen some of Ernie's gifts come forth, I pray that inasmuch as David, in the same way that David accepted the calling, as Ernie is accepting his calling today, 
may you bring forth the things that you have placed inside of him from the time that he was a baby, from the rearing of his father and his mother, things that are inside of him, perhaps at the time they did not come forth, but now we pray that as he has accepted his call, my God, that every skill, every gift, every talent, every ability that you've placed inside of him to lead your people will come forth in incredible, in incredible power and light. For the time is now and we thank you. Thank you for keeping those things hidden for such a time as this. Thank you that he is in fact a gift to this ministry. He is a gift to this church as well as a gift to the body of Christ. Be it upon him greatly Amen. in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the leadership of Pastor Ernie in this special moment, Lord. But I also ask, Lord, that you protect his personal life, protect his marriage. We lift up our sister Pilar, his blessed wife, Lord, as she ministers beside him. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful couple that you have brought to this family community. And Lord, we pray for their marriage and for their leadership in this church. Thank you, Lord. Father, we now affirm and recognize and agree with the calling of God on his life. And we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes. Amen. 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 We have one more, one more thing to, to do, and that's we have a presentation from the youth ministry, the youth group, uh, that has something they want to give you, and we have to sort of clear it away here to, uh, to do this. This has a verse that will be very meaningful. It turned out he shared this verse or something similar to it this week. And uh, it says, Be my rock of refuge to which I go. You are my rock and my fortress. Psalm 71, verse 3. So it's, the youth group wants to bless you with this and acknowledge the blessing that you've been to them. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.